Hello everyone and welcome to the Double DM pre-show of episode 55. It's amazing to have you here with us. I don't want to keep you guys too long as I don't have many announcements anyway. So, Why Your World Matters 3 is well on the way to release and I can proudly say 2nd of March will be the release of that episode. Another thing I want to highlight is the starting of Titan's Core recordings around that same time. Yes, it's finally happening. We are recording our actual play show we have been teasing for nearly half a year now. And as always, if you like Double DM and the discussions we provide, why not check us out on Twitter or Instagram and throw us a follow there. Spotify now also allows star ratings and now is the perfect time if you're listening on Spotify to just click that star rating and give us a 5 star review, which helps boost us in the algorithm and put us into more people's feeds. If you are not on Spotify, however, you can also leave a review on Apple Podcasts to help boost us in the iTunes charts. Seriously, thank you to all, but especially those that support this show by giving reviews and ratings on whatever platform you're on. You guys are the real deal. This helps the show out and us so much. Also, we love every single review we are reading on iTunes or wherever. So, okay, without further ado, let's jump into episode 55 about Cloak and Dagger. Hello and welcome everyone to Double DM Podcast episode 55. How are you doing today, Niels? I could do better. What does that mean? It's nothing I can do about. I'm just an anxious mess right now because of the exams coming up in two weeks and I feel not prepared enough, but I'm getting there. I think I'm prepared enough, basically, but I don't think I'm prepared enough. You know what it, I mean? Mm -hmm. Exams coming up in two weeks. Two days for me. Oh, 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 my condolences. Oh, well, three days recording. When this episode airs, tomorrow I have an exam. So, yeah. Um, What's your exam about? Computer-orientated math. My condolences. That isn't actually too hard uh, if you know it all. Because the only thing we're actually doing is calculating the condition and the stability of algorithms and problems. Now, that doesn't mean a lot of for people that don't have computer-orientated math. But basically, we calculate how dangerous it is to have errors in the numbers in your PC. Which, obviously, this is all theoretical. So don't worry, your PC probably does a lot of stuff correctly because they're optimized. Actually, PCs aren't that well they, they actually kind of suck but yeah it's a lot of okay so what if we round this number the wrong way something that would never anyone would do but we still think about it because we have to yeah it sounds like a pain in the ass kind of exam needing to know it all and then becoming pretty okay to do or easy to do in quotation marks mm -hmm. sounds still like a pain in the ass to study for yeah i mean the thing is i we, we got two exams from earlier years and i used the first one to check if i after i've listened to every recording of our lectures actually still understood what was going on i did took a little bit over the 90 minute mark i have to write the exam but okay i then uh, uh did uh, did some reorganizing of my notes and and did a lot of it um, and put them together in a better way, uh, wrote down the import most important bits and took the second exam. Was done with that in 30 minutes out of 90. And now I'm scared oh, because either I'm doing everything wrong or I'm doing so good. I, I would go with option two. I, I think you're being option two. You're just incredibly good at it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I believe in you. I do not. That's the problem. Uh, so at least one is believing in you. That's 50%. That's not too bad. That's yeah. 0 0.5. That's rounded to one. So yeah, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> <is> exactly. <laughs> I love math. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. Mm, it can be a yeah, lot of I fun to that, do right? math. Yeah, 100%. All people saying uh, math is boring and stuff. I get that. But because sometimes... It's true. But sometimes it isn't. Yeah. Sometimes it just is fun crunching the numbers. Like me calculating mm. the max speed of a D&D &D character that can maxim yeah. maximally be achieved. Yeah. This was yeah. a lot of fun. But mm. put this in an exam and I will hate you. <laughs> It's just the way it is. But yeah, coming back to TTRPGs, was there anything for you the, in the week we had? So I had a session yesterday and we're mm -hmm. still in this dragon paradise 
a lizard folk demo plane and we just found two things we found the supposed dragon horde of one of the god dragons that has been killed whatever treasures lie there we don't know and we actually don't dare touch it because it's, it's a um, horde of fucking god dragon all dragon hordes are cursed which is fun but also we found the, one of the items from the horde in the gladiatorial arena so we split up the dwarven king fighter and my ranger went to the arena to get that laugh and now we're in the arena and oh we oh we we want to fight so badly that's it would be so cool if we could oh yeah oh, I, I would love it and the other two found the horde and yeah we are in the process of uh, calling a dragon council for which we actually found the room to do the dragon council in mm -hmm. because this god dragon had a big fucking pyramid that actually had a council room in it for dragons the size of fucking buildings that's a huge ass pyramid yeah <laughs> 400 by 400 meters it's okay that, at that, the base oh. or something was something mm. that that might have been said but maybe that's not correct entirely we don't have exact measures but it's a fucking huge pyramid for our american friends around 1000 300 feet yeah. by 1,300 feet. That's like nearly double the pyramids of, of yeah. Gizeh. It, it's a huge fucking pyramid. It's a huge fucking pyramid. Yeah, and we are in the process of calling this council, but we wanted to get the best advantage we can for this council. So yeah, that's a thing. But we will wait for the conclusion of at least the gladiatorial combat and the horde for next week. <laughs> I, I'm excited to hear more of that because god dragons and dragon councils always sound like a fun thing to witness. Yeah. At least there's potential to be some major fuckery be done. <laughs> I don't want that fuckery to be done. I just want this to get over with. Exactly. So did you have anything? Uh, yeah, I had a session last Sunday. Oh. I usually have sessions on Sunday, but this one was, it was a an interesting session because it was mostly mm -hmm. role play and getting information they needed and some downtime activities what they wanted to do some crafting and blah 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 but they averted a crisis from some sort of necromancer trying to take over one of the capital cities in this kingdom mm -hmm. and they did and got awarded a player base they now oh. have a hub which is completely empty but it is still intact it has not it, it does not need any repairs it has the walls the rooms and stuff but mm. no furniture or anything so they can do whatever the fuck they want with it mm. and i'm excited to see what they want to do with it and they decided finally the group decided on a name they are called draco somnium so basically dream of dragons or the dreaming dragon or mm. however you want to interpret what it is yeah they said there but mm -hmm. i like it mm -hmm. because they were all brought together by a dream about the god dragons fighting or be a reawakened so that's why they chose this name mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah nice excited to see where nice. this is going yeah um player bases are actually a lot of fun and I love that you didn't give them a haunted house that they have to clear out first. But that's fun. It's also kind of too cliche yeah, for me. Yeah, it, it's just a normal house, two stories, four to five bedrooms. And they have a huge open space in the bottom floor and the ground floor, mm -hmm. which they can potentially turn into a tavern if they like to. Ooh. So there's some potential there. I didn't that's a lot of potential. in a specific way. Because in the ground floor, there are just two rooms, one storage room and one kitchen. And the rest is just an open hall or an open mm -hmm. room with some pillars holding the top floor mm -hmm. but overall they can do whatever they want with it they can oh, nice. insert new walls in there if they want to split the room in half or anything or they don't it's up to them and that's mm -hmm. and we have one more day of leisure or downtime in game before the next big thing they know about is going to happen the mm -hmm. circus of one of the backgrounds of one of the players is coming to town and it is somewhat linked to some mysteries they found because there was some sort of abyss dwelling faceless wanderer entity they fought and in its lair they found a ticket to the carnival or the circus mm -hmm. and the circus is coming to the town in two days or one and a half days and that's mm. where they are going next so they have one okay. more day to do some shit. ah interesting okay that's, yeah. that sounds like a lot of fun I, I look forward to hearing what that's all about oh yeah you will. Um, so, Niels, it's been out yeah. for a few weeks now, and when this episode airs, the last three episodes have also already come out. Legends of Vox Machina. How have you been enjoying it for so far? 
Sky. I loved it. Mm. I I loved obviously the voice acting, the art style, the music. It just works. Mm-hmm. One hundred percent agree with that. Right? It's it's such a cool story, especially because we don't just get the one side of the story this time. This is hard in TTRPGs and and it's the actual plays as well. So don't beat yourself up about it if you do your actual play and you only see the side of the heroes because that's the side that usually everyone wants to see. Right? It's exactly. The side of the players. But I have to say that it's very cool to see the side of the opponents. The Okay, yeah, I can say the Briarwoods and all their yeah. people and not just see what the characters are seeing and hearing, but seeing everything and making it really a cohesive story for another medium. Exactly. Because, right, this way of studying a story wouldn't work in TTRPGs. But the way TTRPGs work wouldn't work in media, like movie and TV. So it's good that they adapted it and not just copied one for one. Yeah, and I think they did a good job of adapting the things from the uh, actual play to the co- uh, to mm. the animation medium without yeah. deteriori- deteriorating too much. Because there are still a lot of things that you can recognize from not just Critical Role, but in general playing tabletop RPGs. This kind of some sort or some way the story is told somehow resembles what is happening in mm. TTRPGs with some awesome additions to make it more palatable for a vis- only visual medium. Basically. For a medium that has the imagination brought to screen. Exactly. Because the au- the audio obviously isn't the same, but it's still the audio, um, right? Yeah. But yeah, as you said, it's, it's not only just visual, it's just that this also is visual as a medium now. And yeah, not just not everyone your... imagines something their own way. Really, everyone now has the same images. Exactly. Which is and the I plus think... and the negative. Yeah, they're, they're still brought together nicely without yeah. too much of a cut between those two medias. Yeah. I think they, they work pretty well or they work pretty hard to make it look or feel right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree so much with that, right? And what I like is that they kept some major catchphrases in there. As Grog said, I would like to rage in the episode. Mm-hmm. It just, hey, I, I got that reference. Nice. Yeah, it's it's nice that they, 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 they know that their target audience is their D&D audience, right? Yeah. They play into that with them. But obviously, they wouldn't have taken the insider if it wasn't something people understand that are not into D. Yeah. Right? Everyone understands that when Grog says, I would like to rage by the good visual indicators that they have, that he now goes into a berserk mode. Yeah. And that's why they can keep it. So it's really brought together nicely. Because yeah. if he wouldn't have had that berserk mode, I would have not enjoyed them saying that. Because then it wouldn't have been a good visual indicator. Exactly. But it just amplifies or they say it once as a reference to the show and then they keep up with the awesome visual to support that Mm -hmm. further on yeah that's exactly it right yeah so yeah i think we can go into our actual topic today right after our ads so see you then people GemfireFly.com combines nerdy interests and aesthetic attitude into one awesome store. Find shirts of the highest quality and softest comfort along with home items such as mugs, blankets and flags. Collections like the dungeon glitch geeky designs or the spicy not safe for work section offer a variety of unique graphics perfect for your message, attitude and lifestyle. Profits from the shop have planted thousands of trees to fight hunger and climate change while also supporting notable charities and game community causes. Check out the link below or visit GemfireFly.com and skim your favorite shirts right now. Other Earth is a cooperative tabletop role-playing game designed for two or more players set in a science fantasy multiverse in which a puritanical empire of elves has invaded several other timelines, destroying or conscripting every civilization they find. Players take on the role of mercenaries who have had their souls transplanted into genetically modified clone bodies called Carbons, fighting a desperate day-to-day battle for survival in war-torn worlds. Other Earth focuses on speed of learning with a one-page character sheet and a creation checklist that allows players to make a character in under 30 minutes. The game uses the Infinity Odyssey D6 system which is both levelless and classless, allowing characters to evolve by learning new spells and abilities which give them a variety of different ways to resolve conflicts. There are over 150 spells and abilities and when combined with over 250 weapons and items there are infinite possibilities for your character playstyle. The system allows for an incredible speed of play with rounds quickly and seamlessly flowing into one another preventing parties from getting bogged down in any single conflict. This is paired with a wargame style tactical combat system that encourages players to coordinate to gain advantages and a true line and of sight style that, which welcome back to double dm today we are talking about cloak and, and dagger especially find the link cloak to the and dagger passions 
Yeah. I think cloak and dagger especially is a big term, not in the sense of what it maybe can mean, but there are a lot of different possible ways people want to define cloak and dagger. I mean, there is a Marvel TV show called Cloak and Dagger, for example, which was mostly forgotten by people. But there is still that. And that has le not much to do with what one could call a Cloak and Dagger session. And generally, the term isn't really something people know well. Yeah, it's not used very commonly. Yeah. So, Niels, since this was your idea. Yeah. And if it's shit, everyone can shit talk Niels and not me. Yeah, please do. Okay, if that if that's what you want, I won't shame you, but okay. Uh, no, please, explain to me what cloak and dagger means. Generally, and after that, also what it means for TTRPG sessions. First of all, cloak and dagger is not a specific type of thing you do it's more of a general overhand term for a certain type of activity where it is important that you remain secret or hidden or in general undetected and it often involves some sort of mystery in it and regarding ttrpgs you can't really say yeah we are we are having a cloak and dagger session and can't have one until the next campaign because it would be too repetitive mm -hmm. because it isn't always the same objective that you try to achieve mm -hmm. because it's more of a, yeah, we need to do this stealthily or hidden mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. in general undetected type of thing. You need to do whatever it is you want or need to do. Yeah, I I mean, I would agree with that. I, I don't know about the mystery part necessarily. Mystery is a big term, right? Yeah. I throw it around for Titan School, for example. We have a mysterious world and mysterious cool and whatever but mysterious is a big term and i think the mystery comes through the secret nature of cloak and dagger more or less right exactly you don't know what's around the corner in the castle you infiltrate or whatever and that's kind of where the mystery lies with cloak and dagger at a basis but it can definitely be enhanced by mystery elements like um weird unexplainable things magic right magic yeah. is the type of mystery element so yeah <laughs> and, uh, one thing real quick as an addition it doesn't always have to be physical undetected things mm -hmm. it could be an intrigue or an espionage mission where you could be plain to see in the open but not as who you are really yeah cloak and dagger is i still think that the the name implies hidden assassination right but you have a cloak and you have a dagger and you use that dagger and the cloak to get something done which is actually very fun because that's what my own ttrpg is all based around right it's all based around this idea of cloak and dagger being hidden in the shadows assassinating whatever yeah what or whoever whomever right that, that's what that game is based around the game is inspired heavily by this honored series by the thief series and these games that basically play cloak and dagger right yeah you're hidden you stealthing is the fun part of the game at least for me. This honor definitely allows you to also go um, more crazy in what you do, having mm -hmm. very special gear that allows you to do very crazy shit. You have abilities, supernatural abilities that add a whole new element to cloak and dagger but again this honor does that mystery element very well you have unexplainable powers and yet there are still secrets every time you infiltrate somewhere you still find secrets secret passages people talking and that's where that mystery element comes in exactly it i think it shouldn't be the main focus point of a cloak and dagger mission or style of activity but it can be used in a awesome way to enhance the story and the experience yeah. if you use it scarcely in the right place i mean right you don't need it for cloak and dagger we talked about that now but it just adds to that level of i don't want to say basicness of cloak and dagger because cloak and dagger isn't really basic but if you think about it it's a stealth mission right and the, the, the question becomes how basic is that right it's stealthing it's um, in most games, it's rolling dice um, yeah. and, and reacting to dice rolls. But the mystery element adds a lot of stuff to that Cloak and Dagger mission that makes it more worthwhile to actually play through the stealthing part. Because sometimes exactly. playing through the stealthing part, in some games at least, I know there are games out there that do that better than others like every game does something better than others there are some games and probably most games even are not the best games for stealthing yeah because stealthing is always a weird skill in my opinion for ttrpgs but we will get to that in a bit so cloak and dagger right we talked about other session types before 
the highest. We also talk about the jailbreak. Murder mystery. Murder mystery, right? It kind of falls in the same line as the highest type. Yeah. You have an objective. You want to accomplish that objective in the best way possible. With the restraint, this is undetected, right? Most heists are also undetected. We talked about that because if you're detected, you get met with force, but you could still do a highest while being detected. Exactly. Cloak, I think, I think for, for this purpose, a cloak and dagger mission not necessarily fails, but doesn't work as soon as you are detected. Because exactly. if not, most of them would be highest sessions. Yeah, they, they kind of overlap uh, to yeah. some degree. There are definitely major similarities to mm -hmm. those, but mm -hmm. there are not exact p pictures of themselves. They're not the same. Yeah, and that's why I would introduce here the restraint or the constraint of if a cloak and dagger mission, if you discovered on a cloak and dagger mission, more or less your objective is lost right yeah. there, there's a lot of nuance to that the objective is then more or less lost yeah because your main objective in a cloak and dagger mission is to stay hidden or undetected in a heist session mm -hmm. your main objective is to get the object that you want no matter how basically you try to keep it stealthy to make it easier for you but it's not the main objective to be hidden or undetected mm -hmm. this is the mm -hmm. part where the cloak and dagger comes in yeah then let's talk about different purposes of cloak and dagger what what can be a purpose of a cloak and dagger session? Um, well, if you're talking about out game purposes, right? Um, you you ruined your players at your table. First of all, I always think that when you're talking D and D, the rogues always have like plus thirteen to stealth, right, or something like that. And, and extremely yeah. high values of stealth, thief tools, maybe deception as well. Those are the type of skills you want for a cloak and dagger session. And exactly. the thing is that I always think that in, that that in many cases these skills don't get used as often as they should for their player to have such a high value in them. Mm -hmm. It's more on the player to use these skills. Like, okay, I don't want to get detected while we um, walk through the woods make a stealth check, right? But there never is really a, a cut session for the rogue. I mean, mm -hmm. okay, what I just realized is that all three of session types we talked about so far are perfect for at least the D&D rogue. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, um, maybe not so true anymore, but I, I just, when, when I look at the stealth values of rogues, I always think to myself, well, that's high and that's cool because they are not supposed to get detected ever, but like, whenever do they get to show off that skill in, in such an extreme manner? And I think that's necessary necessarily true for every skill if, if you have a high value in a skill at some point at like plus a to that skill i don't know if the points are actually worth it because you don't get to use that skill as often as you can to show it off how good you are at that skill right yeah it, it, it kind of feels that at some point it's just the values are nice and the values you when you get to roll stealth are super cool like a 32 stealth is nice and and everyone enjoys that enjoys that high number when they are the ones rolling it but then you also don't roll stealth as much as to have a session where you can basically feel awesome just because you have a high value in stealth which you should reward your players for the decisions they made in character creation when, it, when they are okay i want a very high stealth value you should also give them the option to stealth often and then that that's where a cloak and dagger session comes in exactly. at least as the purpose for at the table but in the game in the world you're playing and in the story in the um, scenario whatever what is up with that Niels? yeah that uh, that can be different uh, or <clears throat> let me start over in the game you have to look at the goal that you want to achieve that could be in a classic assassination like we talked about it's the big thing that comes to at least our minds when we hear cloak and dagger because like Emil said you have a dagger you have a cloak use that it could be just a small in quotation marks theft thing or it could be an espionage type of deal where you have to gather information somehow without being detected or you could place an object where you need it to be to let's say connect a bad noble to some sort of crime that you know he did commit but do not have any evidence for then you could, with a cloak and dagger mission, place an item there where it needs to be to connect those two together. There are different, and you can mix and match those as well. There could be, for example, in a session type cloak and dagger where you put an item on a ship, and this item somehow summons a kraken and then drags the ship down with. Now you are, uh, you did an assassination, kind of, but not directly, just by putting an item where it needs to be for mm -hmm. that purpose. Those are all different purposes or goals of a cloak and dagger mission, and then you need. 
to think, is there a secondary goal to that? Do you just need to assassinate someone or is there a certain way you need to assassinate to fit the contract, the quest or whatever you uh, you got? Mm. I For me, right, I as you were saying that, I just uh, in, my in my mind imagined scenes from the Hitman games or the Dishonored games um, because that's what these games are, right? They are these cloak and dagger games where you exactly. play the game in your style, more or less, and accomplish missions in a, spe in a special way. And maybe it's just me. I have no problem looking at video games, not only for inspiration, but also guidance and lessons to learn when looking for my TTRPGs. I know a lot of people say TTRPGs are not video games, and yes, that is true. You can still look at video games to gain information and insight into what to do yeah. and what you can do, what, what, because these games still work in a specific way and you can t draw lessons from that for your games and one thing that both these games do really 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 well is exactly this you have an objective and secondary objectives and a lot of stuff to play with go off yeah. and that is in my opinion how to set up a cloak and dagger session make the objective clear make the um make all objectives clear right yeah. secondary objectives maybe extra objective bonus things right uh when i look at when I, when i think of the hitman games you often get this introduction you need to assassinate these two people but there is also this hidden dossier in the cellar you need to get or you can get that will give us more insight into what we have to do next right you, you that makes it very clear what you have to do and what you can do and after that you need to set up very carefully the tools your players will have yeah dishonored gives you supernatural abilities hitman gives you outfits special weapons throwing objects and different tools with that you and can open different doors and right both yeah. these games just give you a lot of gear that then allows you to well actually do whatever you want you you know your objective you know what you have you know the resources you have go off and do it and that's one big thing for cloak and dagger missions and ttrpgs i think is give your players an environment with tools they can use but don't restrict them them to a specific type of way they need to play to get where uh, whatever they want mm -hmm. but just give them the tools and then improvise on that on how they are using them because those stealthy missions or hidden missions are an awesome way to promote creative thinking and creative mm -hmm. problem solving strategies mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. if they are mm -hmm. close to being caught because then their brains think of the yeah. weirdest shit with the tools they have at their disposal and then you just need to get on from that point mm -hmm. but it can be a lot of fun to go off of yeah yeah, 100%. One thing you did mention, though, that I kind of left out with, on purpose, kind of, was the level design, right? Because Dishonored and Hitman don't only give you an objective and tools to play with, they also give you intricate levels you can play. And I seriously, it, it sounds so weird, but I encourage everyone to look this case study. There, there is a video by someone about the Clockwork Mansion from Dishonored 2, one of the most insane levels ever designed for such a game because it's this mansion first of all the level is a lot of stuff outside the mansion getting to the mansion but then the mansion is all these intricate puzzles and and mechanisms that completely shatter the way the game worked before because it was always this linear okay yes you have a house the house is this kind of layout and you can run through and do that and that and that but the clockwork mansion it has levers and buttons everywhere and when you push them walls shift floors open up and shift and everything shifts around you and you and the first time you are in that mansion you're quite overwhelmed because there are a lot of options and they are all and the cool thing is there are second walls right mm -hmm. there are walls there are spaces between the walls where you can walk through and then sneak your way through to your objectives and then you can play with the environment and trap enemies in specific locations where they can't get away from you don't have you have to kill them you just have to trap them so you can get past them and there's so much interesting design and ideas that were put into that that i really take inspiration right i don't make the clockwork mansion again because that would probably be a nightmare for me to run because it has so many intricate things but it's it's you, you learn a lot about the design philosophy of game development and level design Design. And I think you can take a lot from that for TTRPGs because for Cloak and Dagger missions or Heist missions, we talked about it in the Heist, right? Level design or, or mission design or whatever you want to call it, the location you want your players to play in needs to be designed to be an actual place. Yeah. It and needs to be more thing... 
more than a map. Yeah, one thing many people forget quite often, I think, is yeah, TTRPGs aren't video games, but they are still games. If you make them too real, for uh, depending on how your group likes it or not, but in a magical setting, if you make something too realistic, it can break the immersion a bit. Mm. It also just breaks when your players start using spells, right? You need to pay exactly. attention to what they have. And exactly. In D&D, nearly every class has at least one subclass with spells, if not even just as the class itself. Yeah. So, right, if, if you make everything according to, to realism and your players don't play by the rules of realism because they have magic spells, well, good yeah. luck. It has to be coherent with the world you are in or you're playing it. Or the game you're playing, at least. Exactly. It kind of needs to make sense the way it is portrayed. If it is, in, like the clockwork mansion, if there is something like this, you can add small elements of it in there. But if you make it too intricate, it can be quite overwhelming for a TTRPG to explain it to follow because you have no actual visual interface other than your imagination and there you can lose a lot of or you lose track easily rather in a video game you have it all right before you so there are similarities between ttrpgs and video games because they are both games but you can't you can just mm -hmm. take the principles of a video game and learn from them and convert them to a setting that makes sense in a ttrpg standpoint but mm -hmm. not a one uh, one for one just copy and paste into your ttrpg world because yeah. that won't yeah. work yeah, one hundred percent right. You need to pay attention to the game, the the way the game works and the world works. And one good window for that is your players looking at them and their character sheets. Right, I'm I'm the type of person that just designs my games and 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 knows a bit about my players. I I don't want to know everything because then I know all their tricks up their sleeve. And that's kind of boring. I want yeah. them to surprise me, right? And at some point, I want them to break at least a little bit of what I have. Because that is fun, right? As you said, it's yeah. a game. It's fun if my players break my stuff. Obviously, there's a difference between they, for example, circumvent one simple puzzle or one door or whatever and instead just blow up my whole my whole level and go off and say well we did assassinate the king because we blew up the castle because we have meteor swarm as a spell prepared or whatever yeah uh, yeah okay i i totally get that and there are ways you can do this as a dm and i don't need to go into them because um you don't need to prevent your players from doing the stuff they want to do but you can look at their stuff and see okay my players we have a paladin for example okay he has zone of truth so every time he has to question someone for example now for a murder mystery but also for a cloak and dagger session when you go when you go intrigue and he needs to get information from some people he could try to lure someone into a separate room cast zone of truth and ask them out that still has a lot of steps involved that could be fun to play through mm, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong but that is still a spell that basically breaks all your it breaks down all your hey cool i have this very cool noble prepared who has a very deep personality and doesn't want anyone to know his dark secret and the paladin cast zone of truth you fail the saving throw and he goes well now you have to tell me yeah that yeah. breaks your stuff right and that's okay but you can still prepare for that if you think that that's gonna destroy the fun at the table which exactly. it might not actually do so yeah you need to feel if if your players now feel like well okay we have this done in 30 minutes because the paladin had a lucky crit on his persuasion check to get the person in the second room and now his zone of truth and you net want yay sure yeah. let the dice fall where they may i know fudging dice bleh don't get into that but really. Yeah, but most of these spells are worded in a specific way where you can get around certain questions or having to tell the truth. Because I think yeah. Zone of Truth is worded the way you are not able to lie. That means you can withhold information still. Yeah, right, you can. The Zone of Truth doesn't necessarily break you. It also You can also just not speak. You are not forced to speak. But the thing is still that that spell, it, that you should pay attention to that spell if you have this type of scenario because if you don't you're not prepared for it and fall flat because your players outplayed you which is fine again but you yeah. still look at what your players have to have gain a good idea of what they want to try because right we said make a good level and let them do stuff but you should get an idea for what they might try because that will give you more insight into how to how to design the level to serve the purpose of fun yeah and uh, because when you challenge your players and they outplay you this is a fun thing but you need or you, if you have a rough idea of what tactics or ideas they have and how to play this you can challenge them in a better way to enable them to outplay you and mm -hmm. that 
is a lot of fun. Yeah. Even if you don't, uh, if there are three or four different ways that they can out outplay you, but if they don't do it, you, they have a serious challenge on their hand. And then they choose one of those that you haven't even thought of. Maybe this is a lot of fun in cer in certain situations. Yeah. I wanted to get back to the tools for core quick bit because with tools, I don't. I'm not only saying a thief tools, for example, right? With tools, I mean everything your players have. Their spells, their weapons, their whatever, right? Creative usage of those things enables the game to be a lot of fun, right? TTRPGs are games that foster creativity. The more creative you are, the more fun you probably have playing them. At least, right, every time I come up with a crazy idea, either as a dungeon master or a game master or as a player in the games, I feel good. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm having fun. Even and if it fails, because if it works, yeah. it's great. But if you, if you fail, you fail in a spectacular, fun way. And mm -hmm. this makes it a, mm. in quotation marks, good plan, mm. even though it might fail hilariously. But then everybody had fun while doing it, so you're good. Yeah, and especially for the tools, I had a question for you. It's hard to word, but what I'm basically asking is, how do you make sure your players have the right tools for the job? Oh, God. Hmm. it depends on the goal they have. Yeah, obviously, right? But give them objects or rooms or an environment where they can come up with crazy ideas without being, yeah, let's blow up the castle. I mean, what, what I wanted to achieve with the question, it was a trick question because, yeah, don't. Yeah. Yeah, just it, don't. It, you don't set up your play, you don't hand your players the tools for the job because the job is what they want to do, right? Exactly. And this is part of the experience gathering the tools you need for the job you want to do. Yeah. Kind of. It, it all links yeah. together. And if your players have an idea of, of what to do and how to approach things one thing i can encourage you to do as a dm is ask your players do you have the tools for that are you prepared for that because let's face it most players do not like long preparation phases where they have to go through checklists of checklists of checklists if they have everything but still putting the thought into okay our plan is this let's do this that that and then that and then we have a distraction here and that and and then we sneak through here and then we are there where we want to be and then you can still ask do you have all the tools for that job and then your players can start thinking what they need and that makes for a fun short preparation phase because then they while they are talking what they need you and your players can brainstorm what they can buy, where they can get that, how they could circumvent potential challenges they think of that there could be, and how what the tools they need, right? And that allows for a quicker preparation phase than telling your players, okay, what do you want to prepare before they even have an idea of what to do? Exactly. Because then they will maybe forget something and feel awful for it, or they will plan too much and feel awful for it as well. Yeah, but we're talking about Cloak and Dagger, and one part of it is the remaining undetected part. Mm-hmm. It's the most important part, basically. Yeah. How can you ensure that there are ways your players stay undetected? Do you have any examples, maybe? That's a hard one, actually, because I'm not the first person to say it. I probably won't be the last, but group stealth checks suck. Yeah, definitely. In, in the basis of it, right? Yeah. And then the first thing you think of when you say undetected, right? Undetected could also mean persuasion or rather deception checks mm -hmm. or any equivalent in other games or whatever, right? And how do you make sure of that? I'm not sure, actually. It's hard because, right, group stealth checks are not great because if you have six people rolling, you increase the chance of a natural one in D&D, &D, for example. Exactly. I know natural ones are per base rules, are not critical failures or something, but I find that bullcrap and say, yes, net ones are always critical failures because that's more fun for me and my friends. So we play like that. But having six people roll a D20 where each side, also the natural ones, that has a 5% chance of mm. becoming increases the chance for at least one natural one to 30 percent yeah and that can that's every third stealth check basically yeah and i think what you can do to give your players opportunities to remain undetected are obviously the objects they can hide behind or in like barrels or statues or under beds or whatever one other thing that might work are disguises either magical or practical those could work as well if you dress up as a guard in a huge keep not maybe not every guardsman knows every other guardsman and you can be just a face in a uh, in a uniform that could work or you 
you could bribe someone. That that could also work, but it depends on what type of scenario you're in with the cloak and dagger. Mm-hmm. Or you could bluff your way in or distract them to make it to create an opening where you can slip through. Mm-hmm. Bards are or in general social characters are good for distraction, bluffing and bribing people to get what they want or in yeah. where they want. Yeah, I mean the thing is right, you have ways to not make it just a simple stealth roll. Exactly. But at the end, everything you've described would come down to the dice. Yeah. Hiding behind or in a barrel or behind a statue would still be a stealth check. Distracting would still be a charisma check, whatever kind. Performance, deception, persuasion, whatever. Um, Right? The thing behind that is it all comes down to the dice, which is okay because these games we play are based on dice. Yeah. But that still means that there is failure involved. And if you don't know, listen to our failure episode. Failure is okay. It allows your players to become more creative in the ways they actually approach a problem. Because failing sucks, genuinely. Yeah. It sucks if your players don't get the way they wanted to. But that only means that they're going to try a different way. Which is even more crazy, more creative, and more fun, maybe. Yeah, and all this comes back to the thing we talked about in the failure episode. Maybe not put a single point of failure in there. Mm-hmm. Because that just sucks yeah if the game is over because of one single point of failure even though we talked about the cloak and daggers if you detect it your objective fails i I want to get to that in a quick bit but generally i I want to ask this because maybe it's not necessarily for us to decide but how can you make for example group stealth checks better because even if they're not in the cloak and dagger session or whatever wherever i still hate them (laughs) They're still hard, at least yeah. on paper. They are, they are easy fixes, and I just want to go over them so people realize that there are easy fixes for the problem of, well, one person can be the failure for the whole group in such scenarios of stealthing, maybe even performance. Right? Performance is the same. If your group does a group performance check and one fails, everyone fails with them. And how can one prevent that? I usually, if I have group checks going on, I don't make it that everybody has to make the check or succeed on the DC or whatever, mm. but I look at it more like a spectrum, you could say, that one failure isn't automatically the whole group fails, but if one succeeds way above the needed difficulty, they could balance that out again. If you put the DC at 10, for example, and two are below 10 and three are above 10, you still have more than half of the group still succeeding, so mm. I think the group should succeed yeah. as a whole. And maybe count natural ones as two failures and natural 20s as two successes or something Mm, mm. to level the playing field a bit and give a bit more room of Mm. success Mm. right we talked about the natural one and if a whole group grows the natural one percentage is quite high Mm. the natural 20 percentage is just as high right that's the inherent benefit of a swingy dice system if the natural one percentage is high the natural 20 percentage is also high so easy if you play with crits and critical failures then that balances out again the balance still is there and what i do is um i mostly median my group Groups. So the highest roll gets added to the lowest roll, and I divide that number by two. Mm. Does that meet the DC? Yeah. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. And then I do the same for the next two dice and the next dice. If I have an even group, that's easy because then I have also a set number of um, another dice. And if I have an uneven group, just one person, the middle, the middle person just keeps their dice roll. And with that, I see how many failures and successes my group get. And that basically means if the paladin in plate armor has to roll disadvantage to stealth check with his dex minus one and rolls of two and the rogue rolls a 22 that's just a 12 more not not for both but it's an overall 12 for the group yeah. kind of it's it's it's, it's a group it's in the group's roll or at least for those two right it's it, i'm not saying that the paladin gets more self points that he should actually have rolled and the rogue gets put down for stealth but generally i just try to look at would the group as a whole from their values succeed okay yeah they do then they do and if they don't i still leave it open to for example the ones that hit the dc to still do something for example if my players get detected the paladin is the one that gets detected the rogue doesn't get detected when they roll high yeah. enough but i just check if the group roughly does it because right helping each other right it's normal that the rogue would help the paladin if the paladin is too loud and the rogue would the rogue would notice the paladin might even notice himself and be like someone help me how do i do how do i stealth (laughs) right yeah just or for example just putting pieces of cloth between the plates to Mm -hmm. stop the clanking yeah if my players come up with interesting ideas where i don't even know what they should roll i just let them do it right i take off my cloak and put it into this specific joints so the paladin doesn't clank and 
anymore. And I'm like, okay, sure, you do that. And the paladin gets um, now just a normal stealth roll, right? Or get yeah. plus five to your roll or whatever. Just there are a lot of ways to make sure that there isn't a single point of failure on the group side for group checks. Exactly. Most TTRPGs are group experiences. So if one person fails and the rest can't make up for it, it feels bad for everyone. Not only the person that rolled bad, they feel bad because they made the group fail and the others feel bad because their good roles didn't matter. So exactly. one specific thing I still want to talk about that we've brushed over the whole episode already and that is creativity in this. Yeah. How do you bring your players to get to creative ideas? How, how do you make sure that they have creative ideas to have cool and fun ways to interact with the world and the level you designed and the people and whatever. You can't really make sure that they come up with creative ideas. That's kind of on the player side of the table mm -hmm. to do. But what I like to use in those circumstances is put an item or any sort of tool or whatever in a spot where it usually wouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. For example, if they want to scale a wall and they have an immovable or two immovable rods, they can could use those to climb the wall or even through thin air. But to to get to that point, you do as a DM can just give them the tools. The thinking part and the creative part is on the player side of the table to come up with that. It's hard to ensure, but you need or you could give your players the opportunities or you have to give your players mm -hmm. the opportunities if you want creative thinking or creative use. It usually happens, at least in my experience, because a group of four or five players thinks of m way more crazier shit than you do as a single person. Yeah. Because it's just creative discourse. Mm -hmm. You talk about shit and come up with weirder shit. Then you roll some dice and laugh at the table because the dice came off on the wrong number or on exactly. the right number. Both is exactly. fun. Yeah, so... Just give them tools where you can think of that might get a creative use, mm -hmm. but you can't really force them to use those tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can't force your players to be creative. But what you can do is, uh, and what worked for me in the past, is put them in front of a challenge, right? Th that sounds weird and normal because every everything is a challenge if your players roll dice or do something and yeah. But put them in front of an unstoppable wall or an unmovable wall or an un scalable wall and they will get creative oh, they, yeah. they will find a way because that's fun and if they do they feel so great for it but you need to let that happen for that to work right yeah so for example you have this um your players have whatever tools in their disposal you don't even know anymore and they stand in front of a wall they know behind that wall is where they need to go but how do they get through that the mage doesn't have many spell slots left or something and teleporting behind that wall might be too dangerous could still be an idea. Um, and, well, the rogue has some specific alchemical potions and asks if he can mix those together to create a pure arcana potion for the wizard to buff him for one round so he can teleport into the room and see what's up there or something. Or can cast an, right? This is not necessarily a good idea because you need to look at if it actually works in the type of game you play. But put your players in front of challenges that are not easily cut out. That are not yeah. clear for what to do. Because that will make them start to think of their own solutions. Because if the solution is clear, you have a wall in front of you, you see where you can climb that wall, well, guess what? Your players are going to try to climb that wall. But if you tell them, or if you make it clear that the wall is unclimbable for whatever reason, they will find different solutions than climbing. Exactly. It's a principle that video games use as well. If they put collectibles in completely weird places mm -hmm. where you don't see a cutout way to get there, and then you start thinking, how can I get there? Because you want to loot. Mm -hmm. It's the same principle, but used in a different way. Way. Put them in front of challenges where there is no obvious path and then they start looking for other solutions, paths or whatever. Mm -hmm. It usually just happens without you doing much in forcing them to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But don't make this a single point of failure again, mm. because if they can't come up with a creative solution for their problem, the whole thing is done. And that's, again, not good. Mm. But if you want to check up more on that, listen to our episode on failures. Mm. Do you have anything else to talk about? Any point you want to still talk about? Any? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go. I got, uh, we talked a lot about stealth. And what is, what can characters do who are not great at stealth? Other, Other things. things. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, what, what <laughs> other things could they do? Well, like we already talked, distracting, for example, yeah. right? One video game I remember is Crooks, which is a heist style game. You have a cast of characters, eight characters or something, that have different abilities, but you can only take four on each mission. It's pretty basic, and there are different obstacles in the game and ways to do stuff in the game. You have a technician who can hotwire any electronics to your advantage. And, right, that is something that that person can do, and everyone has their different expertises to play into that. And the thing is, right, you, you shouldn't put clear points where your players have to do stuff, uh, and there's only a special... Because that is a thing that that game, my opinion, it's a video game, so it's okay there. But for a TTRPG, that wouldn't be the best, because the game blocks you off from interacting with electronics if you don't have that character with you. Or more or less, the character doesn't interact with the electronics. The others just can't. So yeah. that is something you shouldn't do in TTRPGs. Sure, you can say this is way too complicated for you because you don't have any idea how mechanisms work. You need the artificer for you to do that. But the player can still try. It might be hard, but yeah, it's still possible, kind of. And generally, they can... The player sh and, and with the character should look for places where they can still contribute to the objective. Exactly. And you as the GM just need to make sure that that is okay. Because forcing all your players to sneak down a hallway will not feel great for them. It probably will fail as well, or it, it can fail. We talked about how you can make group stealth checks better or more easy and just generally feel better for your players. But let them contribute in different ways because that is way more fun. Teamwork is way more fun if everyone does their own part to it and yeah. then adds together to all achieve the objective together. I mean, that's, right, heist movies. We talked about it in the heist episode, but yeah. everyone has a different expertise that the different heisters let everyone do the stuff they want to do and yeah. that is it yeah th that was the last thing i had on my mind basically mm -hmm. but i just thought of thing uh, one thing there is still the possibility that you succeed in your cloak and dagger mission you are mm -hmm. not detected and your objective is accomplished yeah but you leave behind evidence think of consequences that might entail those things mm -hmm. or if you manage to achieve your objective think of the consequences that thing you did have because if you assassinate a king there will be consequences. Think of those and what the objective you did accomplish entails. Because mm -hmm. the world revolves around that. They react to the ways or the things your players do. Same with Cloak and Dagger, obviously. Even though they are not seen, there are still some consequences from the things your players did or the characters did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Especially also just as an addendum at the end, if your objective fails, right? We talked about it then, the mission failing. There would be a single point of failure. You don't want that. The objective then changes to flee. Flee the scene, right? if you detect it, the objective is lost because the objective was not to get seen or not detected. Then it's fleeing, hiding, going undercover or whatever else, right? The objective then drastically changes. And that is one thing you as a DM need to pay attention to. The objective does change for your players. So you should also kind of quickly change how the game runs, right? Make it a chase scene. It, it should be fast instead of the maybe slowness that came before. And that makes it a very, very switch that is then still fun for your players because they are completely challenged differently. They are challenged differently by the game or by you in that instance through new means. And that is fun as well. The Cloak and Dagger might have failed, but the session was still a success. Yeah, so... um as we always always said in the episode that the objective then fails obviously isn't that true because you can still play after that, right? Video games would then just fail and say, try again. TTRPGs don't work that way. You can still just play and yeah. So, uh, I think we talked at length about Cloak and Dagger and the things you can learn, especially from video games and how stealth works and how creativity especially works at the table. So, Niels, will you please send us off for today's episode? And with that, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at DoubleDMPod. You can visit our website at www.doubledm.com. And you can donate to us on Kofi. And with that, have a lovely day. Hear you on the next one and bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Niels did not just do that three times in a row. Bye-bye. <laughs>